Traveling the Vortex We've joined Doom as she travels the Vortex and arrives at episode 554 where you don't have to kill to work here, but it definitely helps. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. How's it going, Killis? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. How are you guys? Did you guys have a uh, happy and safe 4th of July? Oh, yeah. Didn't even set off any fireworks. No fireworks. Huh? You still got real no little fireworks ones. fireworks either. Really? Well, you all have little ones, too. So. Yeah, last year, Gemma wanted to. This year, she didn't mention it at all, so we didn't hmm. even off. Oh, we don't. We we uh we thought about it, but we're trying to save up some money for our, our eventual Disney trip this year in September, and mm. decided, eh, why 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 light it on fire? You know? Yeah, yeah. Plus, our our cul-de-sac um, has a a competition almost uh, <laughs> to see who can outdo the other. Uh, so if, if you guys ever want a fireworks display, just come on over. <laughs> you just sit in your driveway. Huh? We, we we can sit and watch <laughs> them blow up their money. Yeah. yeah. Um. But we also, because uh, Miles is new to the household, we were not sure how he was going to handle oh, yeah. it. Jarvis doesn't yeah. handle fireworks particularly well. So we had planned to uh, just kind of hibernate in the basement and play games and everything. And actually, both dogs did pretty well. Oh, I was kind of surprised. There were a couple of big ones that they you know, went off on. But, yeah. uh, but anyway, yes, we, uh, we, we, we had an uneventful fourth on that front because of that. So, Would you guys how watch you anything guys? or uh, read anything this last week? Went and saw the new indie movie. Mm, how is how it? Is I haven't it? been out yet. Um, I didn't hate it. <laughs> Obviously, you didn't love it either, though. I did not love it. Um, I, I, I really was... I, I'm, I'm kind of still on the fence. I'm kind of still percolating, because it, it does some things that I really appreciated that were very, very cool. Mm-hmm. And then it does other things that were like, mm, not sure how I feel about that. And unfortunately, as much as I love the Indiana Jones films and as much as I love the character and want more, at the end of the day, it was very much an exercise and we didn't need this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a, a, a more in-depth spoiler-free review uh, that just got posted uh, today, actually, on on, uh, on uh, Flicks with Friends. So you can get a little bit more of it there. But yeah, it um, we, we all kind of came away. Mel and everybody was just kind of like, Eh, it was all right. And keep in mind, you know, I, I like Crystal Skull. I was about to ask, is it better than Crystal Skull? <laughs> uh, I don't think so, but I like uh-huh. Crystal Skull. So my, t- take take all of my opinion with a grain of salt, because I'm that guy. Uh, you know, I, don't... I like Crystal Skull, most of Crystal Skull. There's parts of it I don't like, but most of it, it's pretty good. Mm. Yeah, I, I, you know. Last time same. I watched it. I, I actually we watched all four of them um, uh, on on the run up to this, and I, I I still think Crystal Skull is a better movie than Temple of Doom, actually. But again, I'm in the vast minority of people with that opinion. So mm-hmm. we also saw we did a we, we did kind of did a double feature of our own. We went uh, and saw that, and then went back to the theater about an hour and a half later and saw Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. How's and that? from your silence, I can tell that you are no, so up to date that, with... Uh, <laughs> it's that animated film where she's a, a sea creature. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've seen the, the ads for it. Okay. I, I, no, I nothing know that I'm marketing. interested in seeing, but... Um, well, I, you know, seen I have a seven-year-old, yeah, so we, yeah. we go... We say, oh, there's another cartoon coming. Great. Did she see the ad for Pod Patrol? No. Thank God. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's it's cute. That's about really all I can say. It's like if you took Luca and Turning Red and mashed them together, Mm. but didn't do it as well as either (laughs) Luca or or Turning Red. That that's kind of where this one falls. It's okay. I mean, it's 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 not a bad movie by any stretch of the imagination, but it was just kind of all right. We've seen it. (laughs) Shy loved it, but (laughs) she's seven, so you know, take that (laughs) take that opinion with a grain of salt. (laughs) That's kind of the target uh, audience. That's all that matters is if you took a kid to see a movie that they wanted to see and they liked it, that's all that matters. Yeah, and she liked indie too, so. Hmm. Did you see anything? I, I haven't want, watched anything. My sister came in town for Gemma's birthday, which mm. was on the 2nd, so it was full of family time, so we didn't really get anything watched. I, I did finish a book called Under the Whispering Door, 
which was really good. Um, it's about this guy who dies, and then essentially it's it's kind of like a dead like me sort of situation where there are reapers, and then he winds up getting taken to a tea house, which serves as a waypoint before they move on. So everyone who dies gets taken someplace. Maybe not this tea house, but someplace else to be kind of prepared and get themselves ready to move on. Sometimes it's a couple days, sometimes it's real quick. This guy winds up staying a lot longer and develops this relationship and completely grows as a person throughout the whole thing. It's such a, it's a really good book. I highly mm-hmm. recommend it. Mm-hmm. Who's the author? Oh, you would ask. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to spring that on you. <laughs> I can look it up very quickly. Uh, he's got a, quite a few other books I'm looking forward to reading. Uh, T.J. Klune. Hmm. Not he also wrote The House in the Carillion Sea, hmm. which was hmm. a pretty popular book when it came out in like 2020 or something like that. But I, I highly recommend Under the Whispering Door. A lot of emotion, good emotion, a lot of good humor to it. It's very well thought out, very well executed, very good. What about you, Glenn? Uh, I think the only thing that I've done is we've caught up on uh, Secret Evasion, and we're really enjoying that. So We, just we watched, started it. We just watched the most recent one tonight. So. I'm still behind on that one. Mm. It's good. It's good. I like where they're going with it. It's, like you said, it, it's very... It's very intriguing and, you know, it's very, so far kind of political and political factions, but it's, yeah, it's, it's really enjoyable. And Nick Fury, uh, really enjoying Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury. The dialogue seems to be really sharp in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really on point. Really, really good dialogue. And it does maintain some of that, you know, Marvel humor, which surprises me as, as heavy of the topic as it is. Yeah, that's for sure. Hello, fellow time travelers, and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so, I'm joined by a two- to three-person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979. That would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including Dalton Hughes and Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex, a Direction Point podcast. This is Tim Trelaw. This is David J. Howe. I'm Peter Purvis. I am C.G. Miller. This is Lauren Cornelius. Larry, it's Fraser. For all things in the Doctor Who collecting world and beyond, the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. I'm Larry Van Mersberg and your host, and I've been collecting for 42 years. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex on the Direction Point Podcast Network. Well, let's move on to news then. Uh, the only bit of news is that Peter Davison reveals that there were plans for a Five-ish Doctors reboot follow-up for the 60th anniversary, but it's been shot down. <laughs> Essentially. By him. <laughs> um, not by... He had the ideas, and he proposed these ideas to the powers that be. And mm, I um, think it was just a family, wasn't it? Oh, he wasn't? Yeah, I think it was just a friends, to, friends and family. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well... Whoever he proposed the ideas to, they uh, said it was utterly unacceptable. <laughs> or the exact quotes. Oh, it does. Uh, it does say to those I showed it to, so it doesn't specifically say who shot it down. So it could have been, could have been whoever was. Although, uh, wasn't it Georgia that uh, produced the last one? So. <laughs> yeah, I think she did help. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. Um, I mean, I, I would what I would hate for him to do would be put something out that people didn't find funny or didn't think was as as good as the uh, 2013 sketch. So, um, I guess I, I'm 
I'm grateful. I'm sad that they're not. We don't get a uh, sequel, but also I'm I'm grateful that somebody was smart enough to say, "Hey, this probably isn't going to work." <laughs> yes, I'd rather have nothing than something bad. Yes, agreed. Yeah, and it's such a tall bar to to try and and, and climb over. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's like uh, well, especially know. as good as the last one was. Exactly. Yeah. It's like you know. Oh, you know what we're gonna do today? We're gonna we're gonna do a sequel to Forrest Gump. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he goes on to say that it became very clear to me that there were too many compromises I'd be asked to make in the making of it. And I thought it'd be best to just leave it alone because the original was perfect. Mm-hmm. Here, here. All right. Well, let's move on to a review and. Uh... This time we are tackling the next, I say next because we did um, Time Lord Victorious like this, but we're tackling the next um, big multimedia Doctor Who crossover. Um, This one, I think, is kind of, upon launch, I think, with the uh, teaser for it, I think caught a lot of flack, but we're going to kind of stick it out and see how it goes. Uh, We're doing Doomsday, and the first two, uh, elements of it are out. Um, the website launched the story with Hour 1, and then uh, Doctor Who Magazine has Hours 2 through 5, and so there are four separate stories all together as one sort of comic supplement in the uh, this month's, or I suppose last month's, Doctor Who Magazine. So that's what we'll be covering, Hours 1 through 5. Hi, I'm Doom. Blame my mother. I'm the universe's greatest assassin, and in one day I'm going to die, unless I can find the doctor. Someone sent death, literal death, after me. I can only outrun it for 24 hours. So, the clock's ticking. My vortex manipulator sends me a new target every hour. The lesser order of Oberon sends me a lot to choose from, and I'm picking the missions that'll maybe bring me to the doctor. 24 hours, all of time and space, will I find the Doctor, ancient enemies, old friends, or maybe I'll go out in flames, a lot of flames, well, it'll be better than what's coming for me, if you see the Doctor, tell them I'm on my way. If you have a synopsis, I do. Ooh, let's hear at it. least for hour one. Let's hear it. Doom has 24 hours to live after a complication in New Venice. This is how her story begins. Someone has sent literal death after Doom. Unless she can find the doctor, she is going to meet certain Doom. Only Terry can help her with that if Doom can persuade her. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Um, I was. <laughs> I alluded to the fact that the, I think the, the, the takeoff to this, the announcement, I think they stumbled a little bit. And I think that the reason was is because I think this the actress they've got is probably going to be good in the stuff that she performs. But I don't think the, the teaser for it, the teaser for it seemed very, made it seem very, I don't know, I don't want to say cheap, but... <laughs> made it seem kind of silly and i don't think it came out of the gate strong with its announcement i think it caught a lot of flack online i think a lot of people that i think there were a lot of people that that liked the uh uh, time lord victorious uh crossover event but then there was a lot of people that were you know upset that there was a lot of having to invest a lot of money to get everything and I think there's some potential for this. So I think that that's why it sort of started out as maybe on the wrong footing to, to explain what I meant by that. But I really think, especially in this first hour, um, I think they've really got the story off on the right foot. It's, it, it is intriguing. I don't think it gives us much more than what to expect because the synopsis for all of this really lays out what's, what's going to happen. And hour one sort of does the same thing it kind of tells us where we're at how it's at what you know what is happening that she's dying and that she's got to figure out you know 
how to find the doctor to get this, you know, fixed. And, but I think uh, James Goss, who wrote this, interestingly enough, is the same one that helmed the uh, <laughs> Time Lord Victorious event. Um, <laughs> I think he starts this off really well. I think he starts it off real solid. I think he gives us a pretty good, not super in depth, but a pretty good idea of who Doom is. And I think more importantly, I think what I like about it is it sets up that she's working for the same assassins organization that Brian the Ood worked for, <laughs> which I thought oh, I found, that would make sense. I found very funny. And I assume that's because <laughs> it's James Goss. Um, but yeah, the, you know, uh, I, I, I thought it sounded familiar, yeah. but I just kind of glazed over it and went, okay. And <laughs> moved on. I, yeah. That's, that's a very cool detail. Yeah. Now. Oh, well I read it and I thought, Oh, that sounds familiar. And, um, yeah, it's the I, the I think it's the lesser something of Oberon. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Oh I'm, yeah, I'm having yeah. a hard time finding it in the story. But yeah, it's it's the uh, lesser order of Oberon. Order the lesser order of Oberon. Yeah, which is again the same one that that Brian the Ood uh, was part of. So so that was a neat little Easter egg and and kind of a fun. Ooh, I know that I know that group. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like her. More importantly about this story, I like Terry. She's that completely annoying receptionist that everybody knows that just doesn't take, it just does the bare, seems to do the very bare minimum, doesn't really care, just doing her job. <laughs> and uh, I like the way that she's written and very much in the way that Doom is, is trying to get across to her that she has 24 hours, she's going to die, and she needs some information. She needs the next, you know, uh, assignment so that she can continue to use her vortex manipulator in order to advance through the time in order to, to find her way to the doctor. And I thought that was really a funny, fun little setup to this story. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I like the setup. I like it. What it really does is help establish the... Uh, lesser order of Oberon and kind of how it works and how this whole crossover event is going to work. And mm -hmm. the fact that each assignment is, she basically has an hour to do it. And this really kind of sets all of that up that, okay, that's why this is broken up into the 24 hour pieces and the 24 hours is each assassination is only supposed to take one hour long, mm -hmm. which I think is a really cool idea. Um, going back to a little bit to like their announcement of it i i had a little trouble getting excited about it more not because it was a multimedia event so i think that's always kind of cool and yeah it kind of sucks to try to gather all the material together but it's 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 nice that it's all not in one place my issue my lack of excitement on it was more of the design choices they made for how doom looks mm. she i I don't know if it's because the actress Suze Kemper or Kip, Kip, Kempner, Kempner is a comedian, I believe. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like they're kind of trying to play into her strengths, and it just she her, the look of the character didn't necessarily seem like a credible assassin to me. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that once I kind of hear her in action or do a little bit more with the character i will be convinced otherwise mm -hmm. but of course it is also the lesser order of oberon so you know they're not as good of assassins <laughs> as the greater order right. <laughs> so that kind of also helps balance that out and go oh okay that's why she's <laughs> kind of doing this but then yeah going through and trying to convince terry of what's going on was just delightful to read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have we moved on to part two yet? Or No, we were waiting for your thoughts on hour one. Okay, I wanted to make sure that... Uh, um, once again, uh, James Goss has that very deft, light, pseudo-Douglas Adams touch hmm. um, with, with the humor. Mm -hmm. And I think it works very well in the short story that makes up hour one um i was 
pretty much on board right off the bat. Um, the, the 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 hook of okay, our main character is dying in this beautiful setting, <laughs> and the irony of that, and uh, uh, you know, the secretary, and you're, you're just absolutely right. We all know that one person. It's like, Ugh, all right, <laughs> let me answer the phone. <laughs> I've worked with a few of those. Um, all all of that stuff was, was really pretty sterling, and I was very intrigued by this setup and uh, the use of the vortex manipulator. And this is how they trigger it to send them to the next job, which is what gives her that extra hour. You know, you know the that she's not going to die right away, that she literally still has the 24 hours in order to do something, mm -hmm. and that this is how she's going to get it done in these hour-long increments. It's like, okay, that's a really cool way of explaining, you know, the logistics of... of, of we, we know why it's 24 hours, because we're doing 24 parts, 24 hours in a day. Okay, you know, but this is the this is the the reason for the doing it that way and it's like okay that's cool i'm on board with that so but yeah pretty much everything about the little short worked for me well let's move on to the uh, doctor who magazine comics which i think as an overall arc is 4 hours of doomsday uh, is what they've they've labeled it and then each one is broken down with a um a title as well uh, the first one being Target Selected, which is really super short. There's not, not a lot here to this one. Um, it kind of sets things up. She appears to have uh, uh, jumped into, I'm assuming, is this is this Storm Cage? Is this... It's supposed to be Storm Cage. Okay, and yeah. this is um, River that he, she's talking to here, right? Before she jumps yep. again? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a weird little setup to it, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think that they're, I think they're wrapping back around is what they're doing, because I believe she ends up at Storm Cage again, uh, later on, but not in in this set that we're reading. So I think that there there must be a wrap back around for this. Either that, or we were missing some pages, <laughs> which I don't think we were. Um, yeah, I don't think so either. Uh, but. She makes the jump, and uh, we move to uh, the plastic population. So, so here's the other thing that I liked is for staying on target selected. Um, the interpretation, of the artist's interpretation of death in here is really cool, and I don't yeah, know that we really that we is. keep talking about how she's being stalked by literal death, and death has been an entity in Doctor Who, the new the uh, Virgin New Adventures. Uh, introduced death as an actual character in those as well. Um, so I don't know where they're going with this. I don't know if this is actually going to be death, but we do have a personification of death in, in imagery in this. And I thought that the imagery is is marked up very cool in this. I think the artist did a really neat job. Um, there's not a lot of detail to it, but it's a very ominous look. The lack of detail makes it look good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really, really great shading of the face. Or, yeah, or it's skull. essentially just a you know a ginormous cloaked figure mm -hmm. with a bit of a mask visage that you know you can't really see it. You can't see anything about it. And I think in in a lot of ways that's probably the best way to mm -hmm. represent death. I would um, we, we we we've seen the you know cloaked skeletal figure frequently enough in, in all sorts of media um, that it's all variations on a theme. But I kind of like the idea that the more you stare at it, the less you see. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and especially in a, in, a, in, a, in a Doctor Who story that that kind of kind of gives it some uh, some weight almost uh, going back to the, the science fiction-y end of things with it. Uh, that's just it, it's fooling your eye unfortunately i think that's probably the only nice thing i can say about this first part i think it's a little too chaotic and uh it's too short and you know if they wrap around later i will eat my words as always mm -hmm. um because then they will have fixed some of it but um yeah it's just kind of i mean again i don't mind being dropped in the deep end and being uh you know told go for it um but um, I don't know that the, the short story 
quite tight in enough other than oh storm cage okay but and i now all of a sudden we're in storm cage in the middle of a conversation and it's only two panels long or two pages long and then oh we gotta go it's like that was it that's all we're gonna get with river okay you know what it works for though it does work for setting it up with because one of the things i felt that could have been I wasn't sure how she was going to be finding the doctor, how she was going to be tracing the doctor. So this really does make sense that she pops in here, obviously aware of River's connection with the doctor and asking her specifically if, if, you know, where she can, she thinks she could find him and her directing her to the, the waxworks museum. So I, I think it works in a quick start off point because if she had just shown up somewhere and the doctor happened to be there, I would have been a bit disappointed with that because it's almost like a, a randomness or a foreknowledge that she has that doesn't share with the, the reader. But this gives right. us that setup of, okay, she has gone somewhere to get a direction, to get a starting point. And I think that's what this what works here for this little piece. Yeah, that's pretty much all this story serves is a starting place and a direction. Mm-hmm. And I guess I'm just, uh, I'm, I guess I'm just a little mentally stuck on the, well, who did she kill at Storm Cage? Mm, yeah. Because that's how these assignments are dolled right. out. She's getting they're targets, all assassinations, yeah. but we didn't see that. Right. So again, I'm hoping that there's another part to this that, you know, will come out at some point in time and then we'll go, ah, okay. That's how, just for the sake of the completion so well and, and again it's a comic we're <laughs> limited by the format yeah I get exactly it. also though i think that if we i think if we saw every kill it might get redundant it's like okay who who's the kill this time because we do get i mean they don't hold back on some of them there are some some kills but we you know i think if we had had a, you know pop in and we it would almost get a little bit gruesome that every single time we see her show up somewhere, hit her mark, and then, you know, try to find the doctor. And I think that that could get a little redundant. So I'm kind of glad that this first one is done maybe a little off camera or off, 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 off page. <laughs> I just feel like if it's going to be the first one, that's the one that you kind of need to hold my hand and well, walk me yeah, through it. I suppose and then true. after we get that one out of the way, then we can, okay, yeah, we know what's up now, mm-hmm. you know. Well, like let's Bill move. and Ted picking up people for the history class. You have to show me the first couple of adventures, and then you can give me a montage of everybody else. Yeah. Um, I will say, before we get into the, the rest of these, I'm going to say up front, I really like the bonkers nature of these stories. I think if you're <laughs> going to do quick, short secession stories, that you kind of have to do it this way, where there's some... There's some chaos. There's a little bit of silliness, um, especially in these short form comics. Um, and they they tend to work for me, um, especially visually on this one with the first splash screen being, you know, all of these different clowns, some of which actually look like the Sixth Doctor, um, <laughs> but aren't maybe necessarily the Sixth Doctor because there's one that I think particularly is the Sixth Doctor but I think all the other ones are meant to look, not all of them, but I think some of them are meant to look like the sixth doctor as well. So because of his, you know, clownish look. So it's a good way to tie in the sixth doctor to the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I enjoyed this one too. I, the bonkers nature of it, I, I was okay with it had such a, a clever, I think idea for, the nesting consciousness mm-hmm. to be involved with it mm-hmm. and them trying to, you know, get little figures of people out in the world to take over their bodies. I think is a, a, a fairly clever way to utilize the nesting consciousness. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of fun. It was fun. Yeah. This one was just, uh, kind of a, a, I think bonkers is a really good way to describe it. Um, we have some bizarre <laughs> Joker press conference going on. Here. <laughs> uh, an amazingly creepy toy that is worse than 
somehow that thing that climbed out of the <laughs> the last Auton story. Oh I yeah, that little that, uh, that little the creepy brown doll. doll. Yeah, from terror. No, 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 no. <laughs> nothing's creepier than that doll. <laughs> I don't know. This, this is pretty. Oh look, I've got a doll that looks at me. No. <laughs> well, it, uh, the doll, I mean, apparently comes nondescript and then takes on the features, which I think is that, that's of, the creepy yeah, part, which I think is the creepy part as well. <laughs> like if I, if I ever get an action figure of myself, will I buy one? Of course I will. But if I were to see that action figure being assembled, I, that, you know, or, or <laughs> quote unquote magically, oh, there it is. Now it looks like me. Nee, that's, that's a little too, <laughs> that's a little too pod person-y, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, and yes, Glenn, to your point, I definitely think the uh, the one sixth Doctor clown in the in the big splash panel is the sixth Doctor uh, in the splash panel because when we get down to uh, uh, Doom's first comment in the uh, well, maybe it is. Never mind. I was just saying I, that same splash panel, the astronaut does yeah. not look like the sixth doctor. I agree, but if you, but then I don't know how yeah. he would have got into well, that suit. That's just if, if you go on though, we get another shot of the stage and then we get a closer look and it is the sixth doctor in there. So I'm right. kind of like you. I don't know how else he would have got into that, that costume, but. And then I, we later see a clown that looks like he might even be kind of wearing the same outfit and have the same water gun but has different hair color yes yeah so it's like it's trying to be the sixth doctor but not i guess we're dealing with you know imposters right yeah and also i think there i think there's some bait and switch here until we do we are um presented with the the fact that the guy in the astronaut suit is actually the sixth doctor so mm-hmm what do you think of the uh, the the flop that the uh, the flip flop of the politician? Which oh wow, you're telling me a politician <laughs> suddenly changed his mind right. and voted the other way? I see what you, you did there, right? <laughs> I don't have much more I can say about this one. I mean, let's go ahead and move on to the the next one, which is High Noon in Hollywood. Um, <laughs> Which uh, I when I when I got to this I thought oh Keith's gonna like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's the chase meets Cyberman, yeah. which is awesome. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's even a panel of Cybermen as the Universal monsters. Mm-hmm, yep. And what's really clever is the one list looks like the mummy almost looks like it's a Mondazi and <laughs> Cyberman. Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was a lot of fun. That was pretty cool. It kind of gives new meaning to uh, you know the lurching, uh, lumbering <laughs> uh, villain. Mm-hmm. Like what? What lumbers? Frankenstein. You know what else lumbers? Cybermen. You know what really lumbers? Cyber Frankenstein. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I, I love the the, the panel that uh, has them all lounging around the bar. It's very Westworld. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, we we go from ridiculously silly to kind of heartbreaking right off the bat. That yeah. her her target in this one is you know oh her her father has hired the assassin to kill her daughter be, or kill his daughter because oh she's been converted cyber converted yeah which that's terrible uh, it it, yeah. it is terrible but it's 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 one of those situations where if you've got a hit and you've got to do a hit at least it there's a good reason for it having to happen. And so you don't feel so, I mean, it, it's almost like a mercy killing at this point. And so yeah, I think that true. makes it a little better. And the fact that you can see the hair braid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, coming out of the side of the helmet. Yeah, it does get pretty serious and pretty sad, but. Once again, Glenn dropping little nuggets of knowledge on us like, you know in between breakdancing gigs he used to be an assassin for hire <laughs> it just it just comes across as the voice of authority yeah i don't know i guess w- w- once again i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> <laughs> just you know if you're gonna have a hit you 
dude, really? Who talks like this? <laughs> okay. Well, you know. I guess I'll be quiet because who knows? Maybe I'm on the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I won't be forced to talk about it. Um, let's move on to uh, <laughs> the Horn of Dilemma. Um which uh, sets us in what looks like a Renaissance fair to start off yeah. with. <laughs> um, I got the impression that this is like a world. So this was an earth in the past. This was a world somewhere where they just happened to have this Renaissance look at this time. Right. I'm not confusing that. That's the vibe I got as okay. well. Okay. Yeah. I think there was a 10th um, doctor story that we read that was sort of similarly set in one of the Titan comics, but and I think that's where we came down on that one as well. Um, this one I kind of like because it's, she kind of does the right thing in this one. She doesn't, doesn't do the assassin thing, although that's kind of what she's there for. This is, this is a hit, but when she gets there, it's more of a dispelling of these uh, so so-called unicorns, which, there's a bait and switch again because they actually are unicorns. She just happens to have baited and switched these people so that they couldn't be selling these unicorns because now the people that are there to buy the unicorns think that they're being swindled. And so I thought that was kind of a clever turn and makes her out to be a bit of a hero here because she's actually protecting these uh, majestic beasts rather than the idea of, you know, taking a hit on on somebody or something in this case in this era so yeah she was hired to kill the idea of the yeah, unicorn which i thought was as clever. opposed to the actual unicorn it doesn't quite make sense to how joe is there though joe joe Grant? joe is the uh yeah where the woman that talks to her with the uh the one with the unicorn is Joe. That kind of blondish, got, reddish hair. I got the, and you even see her going into a TARDIS. Mm-hmm. Oh, she so does I, at I, the I, end. Oh, I didn't even notice that. I, I guess. Okay, it's well, just that's a why. Of that's why the she's, doctor is there. That's and, why she's there. <laughs> that makes yeah, sense as she, to why. She, yeah, she even says, "I'm Joe." By the way. Yeah, I didn't even. I didn't put two and two together that it was Joe Grant, though. I guess I just. I mean, there are a lot of girls named Joe. <laughs> there was a Joe on Facts Alive. Um, <laughs> yeah, if I'm reading a Doctor Who story and you have a woman introduce herself as Joe, I'm going to automatically assume. Well, it's Joe we've, Grant. we've got a we've got another it's Rose true. coming up on Doctor Who, and and we already know that it's not Rose Tyler. So, I the jury is out on that until I see it. <laughs> uh, I that's can, like also one of the few times it's ever happened. Well, yeah, that, in it, the sixty years, that is true. I will give you that. I mean. Yeah, no, I liked this story. I thought it was fun. Um, overall, I think that this little collection was kind of a neat little start to this. I'm sort of glad that they chose to start with comics, especially yeah. in this format, because it does give you a little run up to some of the more long form ones that we're going to get to later. Um, so this kind of gives you a little little dose, little uh, feeds you little doses of who doom is um, from at least this perspective. And I, I think these work really well to get the story started. Well, and you know, with the format that we're following of it's 24 hours, you know, the first several hours aren't going to be a lot of heavy plots or what's really going on. You know, yeah. they got to tread their, We've gotta their get water 20, a little bit. we got to get 24 of them in. <laughs> right. So it's nice that these first five or four, uh, not kind of in the initial one are kind of, yeah, they're, they're a little bit of filler, but they're short, quick filler mm-hmm. and fun to read. Yeah. So it's not yeah. like I'm spending three hours on something that really doesn't matter in the long run of the story arc. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Although we don't know why she thinks she's dying, right? No, we don't. And I'm hoping that, and, I, and I'm kind of glad we don't, because I think that is something that I think they can hold on to and reveal as we go along. And, and yeah. I think the overall, theme can kind of grow as these small stories are happening and if they do it right i think that'll work i think the other thing that i like about this already so far is whereas time lord victorious 
was happening on so many different fronts that it was really difficult to kind of wrap your brain around what was happening when. This one makes more sense because nice it's linear. going to be linear and we're going to be following one person as our narrative through this entire adventure. And so I think this is going to, in some ways, I, I enjoyed a lot of Time Lord Victoria. So we're, it had some clunkers, but um, but I think in some ways this is going to be better in that sense of it's going to be easier to follow along. Yeah, I think so too. I almost wonder if it's being done in such a way that maybe they realized with Time Lord Victorious, you mm -hmm. know, when they got to the end of it after everything was said and done, yeah. that, wow, that was fun, and yet maybe our reach exceeded our grasp. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. Uh, and so maybe they're going to apply some of the lessons learned from that to this series and do things just a little differently. So right. that, that may that may be something that we see kick in. Yeah, especially since, obviously, Goss has some uh, hand in this, especially starting us off here. It kind of makes me wonder if he was tasked to kind of um, steer this as well. Um, mm -hmm. There is an article in uh, Doctor Who Magazine, which I have not gotten around to re read yet, but does go a little more in depth of the behind the scenes of uh, the Doom saga and, and what they're doing with this multimedia event. And I had meant to get that read before we got, uh, but I had I put it on the back burner and forgot all about it. So um, mm -hmm. next week, maybe we take a look at that and, and just have a little bit of insight when we come into this a little further. So, Hi, I'm Rupert Booth. I am known as Paul Ferry. And my name is Barry Williams. Together, we host Time Ram. Time Ram's a cruel mistress. It's a random number generator. That also. We roll a number from 1 to 30, and that's our doctor. Then 1 to 300 for the story, and then we ram them together. Even if it doesn't make sense. Cruel, I tell you. Time round. Putting the wrong doctors in the wrong stories, so you don't have to. You're listening to Travelling the Vortex. You are invited on an adventure across all of time and space, in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Goldbranson, Asad Cheshki, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire Hooniverse. On Shuffle. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to Traveling the Vortex. All right, well, speaking of the uh, schedule, what's coming up on that schedule? Well, coming up on the schedule, next uh, time on the program, we return to the world of the 60th anniversary tie-in that we're still in now uh with our beep the meep adversary archive meep meep um meep 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 which is made up of several parts uh including beep the meep gets 3000 years which is a short story in Very dr Who weekly story. number 30 it's like a paragraph long um <laughs> literally I'm coming serious. from the doctor who yearbook 96 the star beast 2 comic direct sequel to the star beast uh the big finish story the ratings war by steve lyons a couple of uh tv action or excuse me a couple of marvel comics tv action and uh doctor who magazine 419 has who on earth is beep the meep so for those of you that like to follow along at home uh that is your homework assignment for next time Following that, uh, we're also going to do an adversary archive. We're putting two of them back to back. This one's with the Toy Maker. We have it on uh, fairly good authority that uh, we have it on no authority. We, we have it on no authority. We're making yeah. assumptions. We have it on good assumption. <laughs> we have it on good assumption based on the trailer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, the Toy I'm Maker got, will be making an appearance. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll be we'll be going in over that. Of course, we have uh, we've reviewed the Celestial Toy Maker. Um, at mm -hmm. least the we we did both the the recon and the novel on that one. Didn't uh, we? Yes, I believe yeah. we read the novel as well. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. Uh, so this time out, we'll be doing uh, Big Finish's Lost Stories uh, one point one, which is the Nightmare Fair. For 
extra credit, if you would like, you can tackle the target novelization of the Nightmare Fair. We'll also be taking a look at uh, Games, which is a brief encounter short story from Doctor Who magazine, and The Greatest Gamble, uh, which is a comic from Doctor Who magazine, number 56. And then we'll get back into uh, Once in Future on the next one, along with uh, the next part of Doomsday, which would be hours six through seven, six and seven. Mm -hmm. Wow, why did I read that that way? Yeah, so lots of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Uh, so lots of stuff coming up to celebrate the 60th anniversary here on the program. Yeah. Lots in the pipe. And I'm excited to do it because um, I really, I was, we were just, I was, I watch a lot of uh, Doctor Who YouTubers and uh, there's been at least three different ones that have brought up that these last few months have not felt like the 60th anniversary year. It doesn't feel like there's anything happening. With the exception of the Doom thing that got kicked off just recently, there doesn't really feel like there's a lot happening for this being the 60th anniversary. And I'm kind of in that same zone. And so mm -hmm. I'm really excited that we're kind of doing these tie-ins because mm -hmm. it does keep it connected. But I'm really hopeful that the ball will get rolling from the production uh, uh, you know, on this and, and really make it feel a little bit more like a, a big anniversary year. Cause it is 60 is huge. Yeah, it is. Well, and you know, what's even interesting is when I went to do the homework assignment, um, I, I went to the, you know, doctor who website to get to the, the short story for part one of doomsday. Mm -hmm. um, but I screwed up and went to BBC mm dash doctor here whatever the right. whatever the whatever the address is kind of the old home yeah was thoroughly confused <laughs> because it's all jody whitaker and flux and oh the official trailer for series 11 and it's like when was this last updated <laughs> i mean there's no mention of the 60th anniversary yeah on that page at all and I, it, it just kind of took me aback and I had to backtrack and, you know, quite literally figure out, okay, where do I need to go for this? And what's the official website now? <laughs> <laughs> so for, for those of you that don't know, it ain't on bbc.co no right, more. Right. <laughs> well, and uh, I think BBC still maintains whenever a, a story is released. So that's why you've still got some flux and things like that on there is because when the stories are released, they're still, you know, they are still connected to those releases of those. But when it comes to the show as a whole, yeah, it's TV, which is kind of the home now of, of everything. So update your, uh, update your, your bookmarks, update your bookmarks. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right, of course, you can uh, continue to follow us on TravelingTheVortex.com. And if you get any value out of the podcast, consider putting some value back into it. You can do that by clicking on our Patreon link and uh, become a Patreon supporter. Uh, when you do become a patron of the podcast, you unlock more audios and specials from us. Also, please consider giving us a five-star review wherever you subscribe to the podcast. That'll help bump us up in the ratings and recommendations. And uh, make sure you follow us on the various social medias as well. That's going to do it for this time. Until next time, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied. Direction point. Direction point. A Doctor Who podcast network.